Welcome to this training session for neurosurgeons. This session, as you all know, is regarding emergency neurosurgical procedures. In this session, we'll be discussing regarding optimal and quick management of subdural hematoma. So you all know, but let me tell it in a brief way. Subdural hematoma is accumulation of blood between the cortical surface of the brain and the dura mater. This is usually because of traumatic brain injuries, but sometimes it can be spontaneous. So let me share my presentation. Before sharing my presentation, let us discuss regarding the indicate, classical indication for surgery for subdural hematoma. An acute subdural hematoma requires surgery when it is the thickness of the subdural hematoma is more than one centimeter are the midline shift because of subdural hematoma and the underlying cortical edema is more than 0.5 mm. And also in some cases, which doesn't fulfill this criteria, but there is fall in Glasgow comma scale, or there's a deterioration of the neurological status of the patient by more than two points, or when there is decortication, where is asymmetric posturing of the patient, or when there is asymmetry of the pupils without local eye injury, or when you have already placed an ICP monitor and it is refractory and it is more than 20 mm, more than 20 mm of mercury, even after adequate medical management. Now let us go into the surgical management of dural hematoma. As I keep on telling, for any emergency neurosurgical procedure, as a neurosurgical resident or a neurosurgical trainee or a neurosurgical consultant, you should be adequately trained. You need to be fast enough, at the same time meticulous enough. All these are life-saving measures. And so try to be uh, as adept as possible at these procedures. So let me share my screen. So let us revise the classical indication for the surgical intervention for subdural hematoma. So a thickness of greater than 10 mm, a midline shift of greater than 0.5, greater than 5 mm, and in some condition where the thickness is less than 10 mm and the midline shift is less than 5 mm, but which is, which is accompanied by neurological worsening by more than two points on the Glasgow coma scale, asymmetric pupil, are fixed and dilated pupils are where the intracranial pressure is more than 20 millimeters of mercury. So this is one classical example of an acute subdural hematoma. You can see the thickness of the bleed is obviously more than one centimeter. The midline shift, which I'm showing now, I think this is a straight line which has drawn with the hand. So this midline shift is more than five mm. So this is a classical indication for, for surgical intervention in the case of acute subdural hematoma. So let us begin from the, uh, from the positioning. As I've told, I keep on telling positioning in neurosurgery is very, very important. So let us see what are the important tips for positioning in for a case of acute subdural hematoma. First thing is when you are positioning the head, would you prefer to put it on a head ring or a three pin headrest? This varies from surgeon to surgeon. I prefer to position the head on a head ring because it saves time. Because it's an emergency, every movement counts. So I prefer to put it on a head roll so that I will be able to save the time. I raise, I put a rolled sponge, a rolled towel under the ipsilateral shoulder so that I will be able to rotate the head to the opposite side at least by 30 to 40, at least by 45 to 50 degrees. This prevents twist on the neck. Suppose because it's an emergency, suppose I have not cleared the neck of fractures because of any reason, then I would like to position the patient in semilateral position and secure the neck with a cervical collar. You can see the cervical collar. If I have not cleared the neck of a cervical spine injury, if it's not a, if I have cleared the neck of cervical spine injury, I would prefer to keep the patient supine with the head rotated, rotated to the opposite side. 
one more important is you should ensure that the head head um, head end of the patient head is above the heart level that is i will place the patient in a reverse trendelenburg bulb position this ensures venous return venous return and prevents excessive bleeding and also prevents an excessive bleeding coming to the skin incision for the for a large frontal temporoparietal acute subdural hematoma the classical skin flap is which is usually taken is a falconer incision or the reverse question shape flap the flap starts in front of the tracheus above the zygomatic arch so this is a starting point then it takes the shape of a reverse question mark it takes the shape of a question mark that is it raises superiorly towards the vertex just above the level of the pinna i take my incision back and superiorly i ensure that the parietal eminence is covered by the incision and about 1 to 1 and 1/2 cm from the midline i turn it anteriorly reaching the hairline i will ensure that this distance from the midline is at least 1 to 1.5 cm some surgeons prefer to take the incision until the midline but they ensure that there is sufficient gap between the barrels and the midline and, and the midline and the midline um one more thing uh, when you are taking this incision in slim patients in in majority of the patients you can palpate the superficial temporal artery so this is our the superficial temporal artery which you are able to see so when you are planning the incision plan the incision in such a way that you are not injuring the superficial temporal artery superficial temporal artery provides blood supply to our skin flap so if you preserve the superficial temporal artery there are high chances that you are ensuring the viability of the flap one more important thing which you have to take is put your entire efforts to make the base of the flap as wide as possible if you make a flap like this that is base is very thin but the length of the flap is very large then this may compromise the vascularity of flap and this can cause skin necrosis so try to keep the base of the flap as wide as possible coming to the next one now it comes to the level of subcutaneous dissection that is elevation of the subcutaneous dissection of the flap elevation of the flap reflecting the flap and then elevating the temporalis muscle the temporalis muscle is cut with a monopolar pottery along its posterior edge some people prefer to use a knife but i prefer to use a monopolar pottery because it's an emergency it's rapid it will cause less bleeding compared to a knife then i use a periosteal elevator and separate the temporalis muscle from the underlying bone this is the direction of my periosteal elevator or a pen pill number 3 and i separate the temporalis muscle from the underlying bone when i reach this line which is the attachment of the temporalis muscle i encounter resistance either i detach the muscle with the same periosteal elevator or i can even use a monopolar cotton to cut off over here some surgeons prefer to i i and also some surgeons prefer to leave a small cuff of muscle attached to this bone flap if at the end of surgery i replace the bone flap this helps in suturing helps me in suturing back the temporalis muscle temporalis muscle to the bone once i have reflected the temporalis muscle i achieve proper hemostasis i forgot i forgot to tell you once i elevate the skin flap i apply scalp clips to ensure hemostasis hemostasis is very important at each and every step 
hemostasis needs to be meticulous at the same time rapid. So the temporal muscle is reflected anteriorly. The anterior reflection of the muscle is held either with, with tissue or in our institute to take a suture, see one zero silk suture and tie it with the help of glove bands or rubber bands. When I'm elevating the temporal muscle, I ensure that the posterior root of zygoma, you can see the root of zygoma over here. The posterior root of zygoma is exposed at the posterior edge of the temporalis muscle and the key barrel is exposed at the anterior one. One more precaution which I will take is when I'm reflecting the flap to prevent an acute, bulk, acute bend at the reflection, I use a cotton roll or a sponge roll. This prevents uh, uh, narrowing are the uh, uh, narrowing of the superficial temporal artery are the vascularity. Once I am done, coming to the placement of the barrel. So one barrel is placed at the key, key barrel. This gives me access to the middle cranial fossa and also the anterior cranial fossa. The second barrel is placed as low as possible on the squamous temporal bone. So this is the squamous temporal bone. I place it as low as possible, as closer to the middle cranial fossa base, as closer to the skull base as possible. Third, bar and third barrel, which is usually placed, is above the mastoid, but not very low enough because I don't want to open the mastoid air cells which risks a CSF leak. If at all inadvertently, I open up the mastoid air cells. I immediately thoroughly wax it, wax it so that there will not be post-operative CSF leak. Then the remaining barrels are tailored. They are placed along the front, frontal parietal bones along the midline, but ensure that at least they are away from the midline by one to 1.5 centimeters. If they are very close to the midline, you risk injury to the superior sagittal sinus. And this particular barrel ensure that that doesn't come onto the forehead, which will be cosmetic, very bad to look at. And if it is very low on the forehead, you also risk opening up the frontal sinus. If the frontal sinus gets opened up, you will have to exteriorize the frontal sinus so that there will not be any future CSF leak. Once it is done, I connect the holes with a craniotome, with a craniotome, which has a dural protector and I open it up. If there's a fracture line running across the bone, particularly if it is crossing the midline, be careful there. You should be gentle enough because if, if you are rough enough there, if you're not gentle enough, you can risk injury to the superior sagittal sinus at this point. Once the, all the cuts are made, along the temporal ridge, I drill this portion with a the, with the drill. I make it papery thin along the zygomatic ridge. Then gently, I separate this bone flap from the underlying dura matter. I use a periostra elevator or a penfield dissector. This is they are usually dura is more adherent along the coronal suture in elderly people it may be adherent all along the bone flap so you gently separate it from the bone flap avoiding tear, any tear of the dura matter once i have done it i gently elevate the bone flap because i have already made the temporal portion papery thin along the zygomatic ridge, it should easily fracture off. If it doesn't easily fracture off, make it more papery thin. If, it, if you fracture off with a lot of force, there is always a danger that the fracture line, is it recording? Yeah, it's recording. There is always a risk that the fracture line can extend along the skull base into the foramen ovale or the foramen spinosum, causing injury to middle meningeal artery and torrential bleeding. 
So we are completing elevating the bone flap. At this point, the bone flap is clean, soaked in antibiotic solution. Then comes to opening of the dura mater. If there is a small, usually because it's a case of trauma, you can find small epidural hematoma in this region. If that is there, suck of the epidural hematoma. Try to identify the source of bleed. If it is coming from the bone, from a fracture line, wax of that fracture line. If it is coming, if it looks like a venous ooze, use fibrin, fibrin soap, thrombinogen soap fibrin, or an apchal or cotton tartis to put pressure and stop the epidural bleeding. But most common source of bleeding is a torn middle meningeal artery. Identify the bleeding point, use a bipolar coagulation and secure the bleeding point. So if there is epidural hematoma, apart from evacuation of epidural hematoma, you need to ensure that you are securing bleeding point. Bleeding point and bleeding source. Once epidural hematoma is evacuated, if there is a lot of cerebral edema, you also do a temporal craniectomy the way we do for decompressive craniectomy. You can watch my earlier video regarding decompressive craniectomy, how we perform this temporal craniectomy. But this temporal craniectomy, in my experience, is required in majority of the cases because acute subdural hematomas are associated with widespread edema. Then I open the dura mater. While opening the dura mater, I ensure that I open it inch by inch. I don't open it suddenly because sudden opening may cause rapid uh, protrusion of the brain and injury to the brain. Second, so I open it inch by inch. Second one, when I'm opening it, I ensure that before I take a cut, the under surface of the dura mater is under my vision. This ensures that I am not injuring any cortex underneath and I'm also not injuring any veins underneath. So I open in the dura mater, tuck it anteriorly. Then I will, the subdural hematoma comes into vision. Once the subdural hematoma comes into vision, I use gentle aspiration to evacuate it. I use a combination of microsurgical techniques along with adequate irrigation. So use adequate irrigation so that the blood clot gets separated from the cerebral cortex. Use microsurgical techniques so that you separate the hematoma from the, cortex, from the surface of the brain. You can use uh, tumor holding to gently pick up the clots. Once you start evacuating the clot, you will be able to identify the source of bleeding. The source of bleeding is usually a small artery or a vein on the surface of the brain. So you identify this one. If the source of bleeding is a very small one, you try to achieve hemostasis using a combination of aperture. Are a surgical. Surgical is fibrin, is uh, fibrin, uh, thrombin soap fibrin. You use cotton parties to apply pressure. And if it is a significant bleeding point, you can use gentle bipolar cautery to achieve hemostasis. But achieving hemostasis is of utmost importance. At the same time, while achieving hemostasis, while evacuating the clot, be gentle enough so that you are not injuring the underlying brain. So once I have done it, this is the time when I take a decision. Whether I'm going to close the tube up primarily, or I am closing the dura with an expansile duroplasty. If the underlying brain is below the level of the skull, is below the, uh, below the level of 
inner table of the skull then the brain is not having significant element but also correlate this finding with your ct brain because if there is severe injury even though there is no edema right now the edema can develop in the next successive days either on second third or fourth post operative day so if you feel that the brain is bulging above the level of inner table of skull or if you feel from your clinical experience from the radiological findings that there is a chance of the brain getting small but in my experience a patient who qualifies for surgical intervention for subdural hematoma either has significant edema once i evacuate the subdural hematoma or has radi radiological factors which predict future uh, appearance of edema edema in next 2 or 3 days so i prefer to do an expansile duroplasty for this one either i use pericranium or a layer of gallia or artificial substitutes like g patch or some in rare conditions i use a facial latter to close this there are also my colleagues who don't do a watertight duroplasty they just place tack sutures and they put a layer of gel foam over this one it is our ex experience in our institute in our place that this layer of ab gel forms a good surface protection layer when you open up the uh, open up the brain again for bone flap replacement so this is your personal uh, personal preference i personally prefer an expansile duroplasty before you do an expansile duroplasty i need to emphasize the importance of meticulous and perfect hemostasis in the subdural space you can also use a tack up suture in the midline if there is no brain swelling i replace the bone flap if there is excessive brain swelling or if i am expecting a brain swelling in the future i will not place it back and i will do it like a decompressive craniectomy i use a close suction drain suture back the temporalis muscle replace the skin flap back re, uh, suture it suture the skin flap in layers so this is the surgical technique for evacuation of an acute subdural hematoma so we have learned how to operate upon a patient with acute subdural hematoma this procedure i needn't emphasize again and again you should be very adept at performing this procedure you should be rapid you should be meticulous this is a life saving procedure and when and when done properly and more than done properly when done in time when the patient is in a good neurological position if it is done then the results are awesome you can actually save a number of lives by this procedure okay let's end this uh, session now so in the next session i'll be coming back with another emergency neurosurgical procedure if anyone wants to speak to me on my appointment can whatsapp me on the uh, number given below and if any patient wants have any doubt wants to contact me for whatever reasons may be they can what they can contact me on the same whatsapp number remember to subscribe to my channel thank you